Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our Lexi Her Speaker Series, Lexington's Women's Visibility Banner Honorees. Today, we'll learn more about community building with 2022 Women's Visibility Banner living legend, Carla Fortman. <laughs> My name is Helen Liu, and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like today's event to you. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator. Jesse Steigerwald is the president of Lexier, an all-volunteer community nonprofit whose mission is to make women visible. Jesse is also a town meeting member from Precinct 8 and served on the school committee for nine years. Lexier has advocated for and gained approval for a new monument that will be the first to recognize Lexington women's contributions across time. Lexier has also partnered with Lexington Girl Scouts to create the Women's Visibility Banners. Jesse, welcome. I will now pass the mic to you to host and introduce our special guest this afternoon, Carla Fortman. Thank you so much, Helen. And it's amazing to be in partnership with Helen and Cary Library. We're so grateful for having an opportunity to come together as a community to talk about women today, as well as women in the past. It definitely helps us achieve our vision of making women visible. Part of that project includes the monument, which we will talk about a little bit more um, after we have a chance to celebrate Carla and discuss some exciting um, experiences that she's had in ways our community is far better for Carla's participation and leadership. We will have a chance to also hear today from Leslie Masson a little bit more about her ongoing research about Margaret Tulip. One thing that's very clear for us is that women have been here in Lexington throughout the town's history in 1713 when they incorporated, and women have been very important. We don't always know what their work has been, and it's been wonderful in partnership with the Girl Scouts to celebrate women across time. Carla Fortman was nominated by multiple people for her exceptional contributions today in our community. So I'm really delighted to welcome Carla here. We weren't able to be together at the event at the library, but the silver lining is we have a chance to have a deeper conversation today. So welcome Carla. And we just wanna convey on behalf of a very grateful Lexington community, including our Girl Scout troops, that we are grateful for every single way that you have lent your time and your energy to this community, certainly makes it a better place. And I invite people to give a little virtual applause that you didn't get to hear at the library. Um, and I can see across the screen that there are a lot of smiles happening. Good morning, Carla. Good morning, Jesse. Thank you for having me. And I, I'm humbled by the honor. So thank I you. I don't know how it feels to be up on a banner. <laughs> but but it certainly looked wonderful at Cary Library and for letting people know when Streetscape wraps up, we are looking forward to seeing Carla right there on Mass Ave with the banner <laughs> um, in wonderful company with other women across time. So really, you were nominated for many reasons by different people. And we wanted to start out by really thinking about your contributions with the Interfaith Garden. Um, I will ask about some other topics that people considered amazing. And for our Girl Scouts who will be listening to this recording, it's really exciting for them to see that a woman doesn't need to grow up and do one thing, that you can pursue multiple interests and think about how those connect. And I can't think of a better person to help that conversation start off. So for people who don't know, the Interfaith Garden is literally in Carla's backyard. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> and I think just opening up your private space in this community way would be a great place to start. How and why you decided to open up and share your personal property with so many people. You may not know, we've been here at this location since 1980 and our only neighbor, which owns land all around us is First Parish Church. Of course, originally that land belonged to this property, but when they moved off the green in 1846, then uh, by several things, they bought the land where the church is on and then years later acquired the lot on the other side of us. So. And the Interfaith Garden really came about because of our proximity to First Parish Church. Because in, well, it's now, we're, we've just finished our 13th season. So 14 years ago, four couples at First Parish uh, decided to grow vegetables and donate them all to the Lexington Food Pantry. They were just beginning to take fresh 
things. Before that, it was always just oatmeal and peanut butter and mac and cheese and things like that in packages. Um, and uh, they needed, uh, so they, they did it, they just started, put a little fence around it for the bunnies and they couldn't get the water hose long enough to get the water. So they used my water. And of course we talked to them and it was people I knew. And they noticed that I was leaving a third of my garden fallow because my kids were gone and we were traveling more and I was producing too much food. So uh, do you mind if we use the, the fallow part? And I said, well, let me think about that. And we had a couple meetings and that's how it was decided. I said, why don't you take it all? I'll, we'll plant and I'll help supervise her. You can bring me volunteers. And uh, that's how it was born. So now I do have a little plot that juts onto the, into the church property as sort of homage to them. But um, the whole garden then has become the interfaith garden. I take whatever I want, but it's very little compared to what we produce. And I don't do any canning and things like that anymore. Those, you know, those things have uh, passed me by. So we're, we just finished our, our 14th year. It um, does it feel like it went quickly to you or are there times where it's felt like the climate has changed a little bit? We have some dry seasons and I'm wondering how that has impacted the pace of the project from your perspective. Well, two things there. One is we have absolutely the most perfect location. We get full sun most of the day. I get some afternoon shade, which is good for the plants not to get too hot. And I have water out there so that the 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 my brown my grass might look brown, but the garden is green. So uh, that really hasn't been too much of a factor. Of course, I've also learned that. Plants really don't need much water once they're of, of, above their small size. So lettuce, once it gets like this, with a little mulch around it, you really don't need to water it very much. So uh, that's another thing. Most people, I think, overwater their things. Um, now you have this one customer, and I'm not sure if we can share the screen or not, but um, if you, I'm gonna make sure it's in the chat bar again for people who signed on after the very beginning. If you go to interfaithgarden.org, there's a photo gallery and you can actually see how the harvested food gets delivered. Can you share that for people who might not know the um, timeless way you're delivering? <laughs> well, we we work just two times a week, on the afternoons from 4.30 to 6 and on Saturday mornings. And Saturday mornings is the harvest time. So whatever is ready to harvest that day, um, we and sometimes in the middle of the summer, we have to do some of that on Friday night because we can't do it all on Saturday morning. Um, but we harvest it, we weigh it, and we put it on pallets and, and we just walk it over in the gardenway carts over uh, to the uh, food pantry. So it's pretty efficient. I think only one time, maybe twice in all the years have we ever had to get in the car because it was raining so hard. <laughs> so <laughs> mostly it's worked out pretty well because you can always put a cover, cover on things. Can you tell us a little bit about the food that grows and who decides what gets planted? Well, I decide that. I'm in fact, I'll get I'll be getting my seed catalog soon, and I usually uh, order all my seeds in January. I I'm trying to learn to be a seed keeper, but I <laughs> haven't been very good at it yet. So uh, that's a skill I don't have. I mostly buy from high mowing seeds uh, in hard there in Wolcott, Vermont and from Johnny's, which is in Maine. And I pretty much stick with organic seeds, um, uh, pretty much. Uh, occasionally I'll get things from other, other. oh, I, get, I guess I get, well, I got potatoes from Johnny's seeds this year too. So, so I decide what's grown and, and uh, the things we've added are some of the Asian vegetables because there's many Asians at our food pantry. In fact, Chinese and Mandarin is pretty commonly spoken there. So uh, we, in fact, bok choy was our largest crop this last year. And I can tell you, we grew 160 pounds of bok choy over this. It grows faster than lettuce. And of course it's extremely nutritious. So it's easy to grow. And I have it almost continuously all the time. Do you rotate what you plant in different areas or do you plant this? Do you have certain things that like they found their spot and that's where the tomatoes always go? Or do you find that you mix it up? Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm 
there's two new books. I, I brought them to show people. Um, one is called Elliot Coleman. Well, it's not too new. He's been doing it for 30 years. It's called The New Organic Gardener. Okay. And he advocates that you plant in rotation according to the kind of plant. So all the onions and garlic and leeks are in one section, and then they don't go back to that section for three, at least three years. Okay. Yeah. And uh, tomatoes are, are the similar. He has half the garden in what he calls greens and roots. So the lettuce, the bok choy, the things like that are, are half of your garden at any one time. Rather than those are rotated quickly, beets, carrots, those sorts of things. And then the brushes, the um, broccolis and cabbages. Uh, I've given up growing them in the spring because they get too many bugs. Uh, so I, I don't do them all in the spring. I just do a fall fall harvest, and uh, and I've been lucky lucky with them uh, over the last couple of years. How do you manage pests? Because we all find ourselves confronted with some so someone who wants our vegetables almost as much as we do. The only thing I use is BT. It's called Bacillus thuringiensis on the brassias. Other than that. I'm so lucky. I've never had a tomato hornworm. I had squash bugs one year only, but I've never had them back. Um, so I'm pretty lucky. I have a fence for bunnies, chipmunks and voles. They, they're regular <laughs> residents. They're there all the time. Um, Sounds like you've managed to co cooperate, co-share co co the space with people and others. Well, one of one, I've learned so much from the people who volunteer and one said, well, it's one third for the you, one third for the animals, and one third for the weather. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But uh, I think really we, we get more than that uh, mostly. So. Let's talk about the volunteers a little bit. And while I'm chatting with Carla, please feel free if you have questions to pop them in the chat bar. Um, more questions is better. Um, so in terms of the volunteers, how has that grown over the years? Because your food production has grown quite a bit. Yeah. So. I we imagine many hands must be helping and maybe more than even before. I don't know what that's like. Yeah, we had to cut back a bit during COVID, but mostly we, we run with about four to six volunteers in each session. Um, so that that's pretty good. Uh, and I have some regulars who kind of know what to do, but there's always new people who haven't been before. Sometimes they bring their kids. As long as they're not too young, they've been great, especially digging potatoes and things like that. Kids love stuff like that. Um, so, and that when we have many toads in the garden, the kids always love that too. So um, really with, with those just twice a week, we, we do very well. Um, and the plants kind of look after themselves, I think more than anything. <laughs> I have two <laughs> asparagus beds, so we have asparagus, and once we got the bees, which was about six years ago now, we it doubled our harvest, which is pretty amazing. So we were doing about a thousand pounds a year, and we jumped to almost two thousand pounds. That's and a huge leap, and you attribute that to the bees. How how did you decide to get the bees? Where did you get the bees, and how many bees does it take to produce that well, kind of improvement? We've had from two to four hives at any time. Alex, I don't do it. Um, uh, Alex Barsh, uh, who's Lexington Bee Company and has started the group at the um, high school. She came to me and said, you know, I'd, I'd love to put some beehives here. I said, <laughs> go for it, you know, that'd be great because it's a perfect spot. We're not really close to any residents. We're you know, back and near a swamp where there's always water. So uh, the bees have done pretty well. She's had some loss with mites, uh, but uh, by and large, our, our bees have done very well. So we have a question about ha harvesting the honey. Does she harvest it and what happens with the honey? No, she harvests it and uh, you can uh, you can buy honey at, at my garden. She has a little place where you can put the money in or Venmo or whatever you want. Um, so uh, that's possible uh, here, uh, but also the like all of that uh, profit goes to uh, the Lexington High School Bee Club. So oh, that's great. So that's she, terrific. And she's she's got I think got a waiting list for that bee club. So she's the when it, when they first started, 
she was doing it part of a national study actually. And I came out to the garden and a girl was just sitting there. And I said, oh, you must be from the high school. And she said, yes, I'm recording the sound of the bee. She had her phone by the beehive and she was recording the sound of the bee. So that was, I'd never thought of doing that before. But And what about birds? Do you have a lot of birds? Because birds are often attracted to gardens. Oh yeah, we have hawks and owls and uh well, I have netting over my blueberries, okay, which we put up every year. But I always tell everybody I spent $1,200. It's really like soccer netting, you know, and you, we have to put it up and then take it down. And uh, the first morning I put it up, there was a bunny and a bird inside. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and were they but, like laughing? <laughs> <laughs> they were laughing. But they get in sometimes it's left a little open or something they find a way in but mostly the netting has worked very well so so we put it up after the berries are formed so that the bees can get in and out easily and then um, we take it off once the berries are finished now helen has popped into the chat bar at the book information for the new organic grower okay. and that is one of the lovely benefits of partnering with Carrie library because we can help direct people to resources i think did you mention you had a second book you wanted i do to and it's called by jean martin fortier it's called the market gardener these two people make their living market gardening so they've had to be very efficient uh at it and uh so that's that's been a great uh both of those are great uh sources especially with composting and and things like that um, the other source of information for me has been the um, Williamsburg Gardening Conference, uh, in which I have just had so many insights from, they've been totally organic. There's one girl who speaks there regularly, quite enthusiastic, who would like to take all the mulch in suburbia and turn it into vegetables. Think about it. She grows rice. She grows, she grows potatoes on the edge of her lawn and then has the neighborhood kids help dig them up and so forth. So if you, I mean, it's such a waste of land to just put mulch on, it is. You've got- well, Yeah, right there. between lawn and mulch, I'm thinking about the Victory Gardens. When you say market gardening, for someone who's not familiar with that term, it, it sounds like it means you're growing more than what you need for yourself. Is that oh, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, the market gardener is is using lettuce and beets and so forth. And so he has to be efficient and careful and uh, in order to earn earn his living. And there are many organic market gardeners, especially in New England. I think we, we have maybe more per capita than other places. It's quite a popular thing to do. And um, we have a question, which is, what is the Williamsburg Conference? Can you share a little bit more about that resource? Well, Williamsburg has, uh, Williamsburg down in Virginia has many conferences, but the one that I'm talking about is called the Annual Garden Conference. It usually has a theme and featured speakers. And the first one I went to just with Elaine Doran, actually, the two of us went down. We were just, we couldn't write things down fast enough. There was so much. <laughs> solid information, totally organic, not use, you know, they said, don't use it, no miracle grow, no blue liquids, nothing. <laughs> it was at that time where I was using that, I thought, you know, this is, makes lettuce grow fast, but <laughs> to keep your soil healthy, that's, that's the main point of all the organic gardeners is to keep your soil healthy. You won't get pests. You won't have problems if you pay attention to your soil. I, I don't even till anymore and wow. I'm using all green manures. I, I do put some composted cow manure on my um, asparagus beds and rhubarb. But other than that, I'm just tilling. Even Wilson's, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's all green growing right now. They put their own compost and uh, winter rye and field peas, uh, things like that, which you then just plow under and it keeps your soil. No, as, as we're speaking, it's a week before Thanksgiving, which we thought was lovely time to be thankful for your work. Um, but how are you preparing the gardens or how are you putting them to sleep for the winter right now? Well, you can thank the Boy Scouts, not the Girl Scouts, but the Boy Scouts have for the last three years have helped me put the garden to bed. So what's ever left after we finish our sessions needs to be cut up and the compost bin and things pulled like they pulled up all the tomatoes and washed the racks and 
did all the put those things away for me just uh, last. Actually, they worked on Veterans Day. It was supposed to be the week before, but something came up for them. Um, they also built me a, a wire cage. I don't put any of the leaves out of my garden, which is considerable amount. They made me a cage of chicken wire and we used, we last year we used every single leaf we saved in the garden for the paths and for the compost. It's, and then um, I used to do newspaper and hay, which always in a wind would blow to the side and was kind of a pain. And then you have to buy the hay on our paths and after you wear them down, then you just put some more down. So that's, it's that's amazing. Terrific. Right. So the leaves, leaves become the pads. That's just what a, and it's a savings in money too, because buying mulch is expensive. And then right. there's the labor of carrying it and putting it all out. And sometimes it brings its own come alongs with it in terms of different funguses as well. <laughs> True. Although some of those different. can be good because I once had morels growing after I bought some compost. Oh, that's, <laughs> that, that, that is, wonderful. that's like a little bonus. That's very nice. So um, go ahead. I was going to say, um, in terms of tracking your production, how do you do that? Is there a weighing? How do you figure out what you've grown and keep track? Well, I'm doing more detailed notes. This year was the first year I kept track of what variety I planted and how much it produced. And I, I have yet to go through those things. I have all the sitting here, it's a couple hours of work. Mark and Dean uh, has carefully uh, uh, keeps track. Uh, he goes through, we weigh everything before we take it. And he keeps track of that. And that, uh, so as of October 29th, we, we produce, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. I'd say about 30 different kinds of things. And then like the top of the list was bok choy. And of course the bottom was thyme, the spices, because they don't weigh very much. Um, and it, and the, just using weight is kind of deceptive because when you grow giant pumpkins and things, of course, they weigh more than lettuce. So, um, it, but it, it, it is a metric. And then this is how, if you can see. Carla, hold it a little higher. Our harvest has started with asparagus and rhubarb. Okay. This is yeah, April great. where the first things you harvest are uh, asparagus and rhubarb. And then this is where we were uh, at the end of the season. So that was at this year, um, was about 1700 pounds of, of produce. And he, he has records, I think I, I think I have a note. Yeah. Um, he has records over the years, 2018, 1900 pounds, 2019, 1800 pounds, 2016, 1700 pounds. So we've stayed, since we've had the bees, we've stayed up there mostly, no matter what the weather really. So that's good. You mentioned briefly COVID and I'm curious, how did that impact everyone, both the volunteers and, and you as a, as a family in terms of having a space that is your private space, but you have opened it to people in the community? Well, first of all, it's outside. Most everything is outside. So that's a big plus as far as the garden. But we made everyone mask and we harvested with gloves before they realized that contact, you know, wasn't a factor. So it, and we limited our, I mean, some people didn't even want to come, you know, because uh, everybody has a different comfort level with those things. Um, so uh, we weathered it. Um, we went through a lot of gloves, but Mark Sandine found me a box from TerraCycle that took them all to recycle. So we felt oh, that's great. That. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And I see um, Amy Swanson added in our chat bar that in 2022, um, there was 1,698 pounds with 45 varieties of produce grown. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's a great help for the garden. She certainly is. So one thing that comes across when you're sharing is how many different people are helping in many different ways, tabulating, sharing bees, volunteering. Do you find that you end up looking for help or people come to you with an idea or is it a mix? And how do you decide? I mean, well, it's, it's a lot of work to keep track of a lot of people. You're really a manager. <laughs> well, but that's, that's where Amy and Marty Caval and this new girl, uh, Minoui, uh, they take care of the scheduling. And of course, it's from the Interfaith Council. So each church has a liaison person 
or church or synagogue or, or temple, they have a, a liaison person who then is responsible for, if it's a small group, they might do two volunteers once a month. If it's a larger group, they might do four at, at a time or so forth. Um, some subgroups, some youth groups have come and taken over special projects. So that's been a, a big help when there's something to be done. Um, and, uh, and we have, I think, I may, Amy might correct me, but I think it's between two and 300 volunteers in any season. Some of those are the same, but, uh, and I see some people on a regular basis, but others don't have time to do that. You know, they only have June or they only have July and, and things like that. Uh, so I, the, the funniest part of the garden is being at a party and seeing somebody who you know, you know, but they look quite different than they do in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> and then I always say, do I know you from the garden? And that's, you know, right. really garden cool. attire can be a little bit different, that's a little right. more earthy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, As you think about this project, because you've done different projects, which I'd also like to chat about, when you think about this project, big picture, what has been the most challenging thing for you about it? What are the parts that were just not so easy? I, I guess one of the things that surprised me was how many people are willing to work and not take anything home for themselves. That's really wonderful. But also how many people have never put a seed in the ground and watch it grow. The, you know, I commonly have trouble with everything's too close together. They say, oh, that got so big. You know? um, so that experience in itself, that's wonderful to see people, they'll come back and see, oh my goodness, look, this year we had a particularly wonderful crop of potatoes. I mean, a huge amount of potatoes. And uh, people were just amazed, you know, to, to put that little half of potato in the ground and then have a pound and a half come out, you know, of beautiful big potatoes, you know, so um, that's probably been the best. Um, and we've, we've had, I just think it is a blessed garden, maybe because of the interfaith part, but um, one year I didn't, I couldn't get any garlic to plant. And I went up to see my son in Vermont and he, he had extra garlic and he said, here, mom, just take that. And I thought it was just worked out perfectly. Um, and there are many other things like that, that just, it just seems like something just happens because it's, it's a good place. <laughs> where things happen. It's a really special place. And for people who aren't familiar, and Carla, you kind of went over it a little bit in the beginning, but I'd like to pull it out, tease it out a little more. So the land that you're on is surrounded by, by First Parish right now. The original yeah. meeting house back when the town was incorporated in 1713 was on the green. It was the town common area. One thing that certainly comes up in my mind is the town common was a place that was for sharing. People took turns putting their cows out to graze. And it does seem um, very moving and very interesting intellectually and emotionally to think about the town common was a place where the battle was fought. And once that was fought, it really horrified people. It was a place of tremendous violence and loss. Everyone who lived here during the battle in 1775 knew people, multiple people who died that day. And it was a shock. It was a grief time. And ever after, for many people, that place was no longer just a gathering place. It was the site of extreme violence. And we see that in America today, when there are mass shootings, say, places change. Yes, they were gathering spaces, but now they have a whole different atmosphere. Here in your garden, it feels like you've recaptured that original town common feel for all the volunteers and people who maybe never set foot there because they get to enjoy the food at the food pantry. So I'm thinking about that when you're talking about this being a special place. And I'm also thinking about your neighbor. Your neighbor was Anna Harrington, and I believe Levi was her son who was in your house. Do you know something about your history? For those who are listening, Anna Harrington is one of the women in the upcoming monument. And she hosted a spinning protest in 1769 at her home um, where people brought their spinning wheels to come out and protest what they saw as unjust taxation. So I'm thinking about these two things, your proximity to the original meeting house, First Parish, which was the same congregation that moved across the street after a big fire um, and being near the battle site. And then also Anna Harrington's home where a lot of people came to her home for that protest. So it was a very visible location 
a lot of people knew it. And once they went to that protest, a lot of people must have also seen her homestead in slightly different light. You never go to a big party at someone's house and yeah, forget true. the big party, right? <laughs> um, so it's a protest, but a big social gathering. And since her son then, I think, built built the house that you're in, I'm just curious what kind of thoughts you brought to that. You spent a lot of time thinking and supporting the historical society. Right. Well, there's, there's a couple of things uh, in that. Uh, one that I'll mention that the land has never been anything else. It's only been open land or a horse farm. It's never been a dump. It's never been anything else. So I think that's some of the specialness of the property. Um, the house, unfortunately, the Harrington house was taken down in uh, 1875. So we no longer have it, but um, it did. It, it was, uh, I believe Levi was a nephew that built our house and it was not here at the time of the battle. It was, uh, um, in 1794. So you will learn to respect some of those old ways and, uh, and uh, respect the work that they did and so forth. The other thing I'd like to mention along this line is the connection that I've come to appreciate greatly between, because everybody went to church, they were all part of the same community, okay? And now we're many churches and this is just one of their many multiple functions for our community. But uh, once when, I can't remember his name right at the moment, he was minister at First Parish and he had our first meeting for the garden that year uh, and getting together and organizing and so forth. And I said to him afterwards, I said, um, how does our interfaith council um, compare to places you've elsewhere you've been as a minister? And he said that he had never been to another community that had such cooperation among the churches and faith communities. So, and I think, excuse me, that stems from our history and we shouldn't forget that. It's incredibly special. It's incredibly special. And I think it's part of why being able to talk to people who are intimately involved with community activities and community organizing, it's helpful because Lexington has stood out nationally as a wonderful place to live. And those of us who live here, it, it is pretty wonderful. So many of the things that are happening that make it special are coming from volunteers like you. You're an exceptional person, absolutely among exceptional people because you've given so much time and thought and energy and literally sharing your property. Not everybody's ready to take that step, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's certainly um, worked out. And you're right. I think it's it is very moving when people cooperate. Yeah. When we look back at the past, people had to cooperate in a way that maybe they don't feel they have to cooperate today. People, I, I think, you know, even I've been mean, Temple Isaac, I guess when it first started, they didn't have a building and they were in the basement of Hancock Church and the Masonic Temple was a church for a while. I mean, they, a lot of our churches got their start by sharing buildings uh, with other faith communities as we diversified, you know, so uh, that and is. That is a special part of our community. And First Parish, when our Muslim community today didn't have a spiritual home, when yeah. Christ Church shooting happened, the town allowed and permitted having a vigil on, actually on the town common, original town commons on the Battle Green, which yeah. turned out to be a very large gathering. And I know First Parish has, has welcomed people there as well. Um, they now have a, a permanent home. But sharing space, as you've done, sharing yeah. space in terms of the church has also been very notable. Yeah. Well, people often ask me about that, but I, I've never, I mean, I mostly trust people. <laughs> you know, you can't be worried about everything. Not to mean I'm not vigilant, but uh, you, know, you know, it's important. Well, and I don't know. I mean, it sounds like you're producing enough that if the, if the one third for the other animals came <laughs> by, <laughs> you already have some, you know, um, interlopers, but they're the furry kind. But it also, it gets you, you don't want to ever waste any food because you know how much work has gone into every leaf of lettuce. You know, the time and the washing and the travel and so forth. And that, that is something I have a real hard time with in, anywhere. And, you know, we, they just had, I forget how many pounds are taken out of our restaurants every week in Lexington, that un, uneaten. 
Yeah. And on the flip side, so many food pantries, as you said, they don't have the chance to have fresh produce, you know, brand new first, first choice grown just for them. It's often leftover and still, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. but it's not, it's not first pick. And here, here people are getting the literally pick of the crop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's true. We, we, I try to rival Wilson's. <laughs> right. Um, the question's here, with the yields being so plentiful, do you ever run growing workshops to share your knowledge and further promote the work of the garden? Have you had workshops for people to come and learn? Mm. Well, we certainly share with the volunteers, but I've never really had that particularly. I shared with some brownies. Uh, we did some uh, sprouting of lettuce and uh, radishes with them. Total failure, but that was a lesson in itself. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, no, I have not not done that regularly. So that, that could be could be a future project. <laughs> Quite a few of them. And some of us are not affiliated with a church or temple. And so we may not hear about the Interfaith Garden unless we come across a program like this at the library. And so it's possible you will have more people coming to inquire. Um, we, do, we do have a space for extra volunteers. So if people are interested, there is a way, even though they're not part of a uh, faith community, they can still volunteer. Okay, that's great. So a tip for listeners would be to check out the website then and see how you can get involved. Now, we can't leave because among other reasons for your being nominated was the Interfaith Garden is only one aspect um, that people so greatly admire. You've also done two things I at least want to want to touch on here, and then I have one other area I'd like to ask about. Um, your work with the Historical Society included running the gift shop for many years. And so a lot of people appreciated um, the way you managed that project. It was helpful for the society. It was fun for people to go in, whether they were tourists or residents like me would go and do a little gift shopping there. Um, and so if we could spend just a little time um, thinking with you about what stood out for you in that role in terms of community building and supporting the town and supporting the historical society, what were some of your takeaways looking at that? Oh, well, that was also a project, uh, uh, very much so. But for me, I really believed that a museum shop should reflect some of your museum pieces. I really looked for handwoven kitchen towels and throws and things like that. And and Crafty Yankee helped me in all this, you know, finding those things, pewter wear, thing which is now made without lead, things that represented the past but are still being made, handmade today. Um, I don't, most people who are listening might know of Simon Pierce Glass uh, in uh, Keechee, Vermont and in Windsor, Vermont. And we talked with him one time, he was there, it was an anniversary and we were talking with him and he said, if he could make something that looked handmade by machine, of course he would, but you can't. You can't, the handmade touch is always in it. And that something lost in our current uh, life. Um, I had, I lived in Australia for a few years and there were many studio potters there. That's where I learned to do that. And almost everybody we visited had handmade dishes in their kitchen. They didn't have corningware. They didn't have other things. They had dishes from local potters. So um, I'm a great uh, supporter of the, LexArt and uh, the people at uh, Muzzy at the Muzzy Center for the Arts because those local things keep people working in in crafts that are important in, to share. So so that's that was really I tried hard to make that happen, and um, uh, and we get visitors from everywhere, you know, from all of people. I had one. Uh, woman who'd lived in Lexington 25 years. She'd always volunteered in the Chinese community and done lots of things, but she had, I had no idea all these people came to Buckman Tavern and she'd lived in our community for a long time. So I, I think that's one thing people don't realize how many, I've had people in tears, you know, there because they finally got to Lexington Green. <laughs> I had a homeschool mother and two kids come across and they were in their complete colonial outfits they had handmade them homeschooling, and this was their field trip to go to the American Revolution. 
That's it's true. sometimes sometimes living here, people take it for granted. Um, and I know there's also some people who move here because they're interested in maybe the schools, but they're also really interested in history. But then they have kids in the schools and they're so busy. They constantly say, oh, I mean to get to Buckman Tavern. I just haven't had time because sometimes when you're in that school swirl, um, oh, yes. <laughs> it's tricky. Now, the society has set up more programs with kids in mind in particular. So it, it can be a way people can get to know about the history through the society, through the kids programming too. So that is one, one possibility. Um, the other thing that people shared in their nomination was they really appreciated the work you did to set up Crafty Yankee. And we've spoken with Kathy Fields who credits you and all of the ways that you brought local artists together um, in a more formal setting where they could have their wares sold and people could find them, you know, not just at specific times of the year. So looking back at that experience, we can see how you <laughs> brought that into the <laughs> gift shop. But as we roll back, what were some of the things that stood out for you as the best parts or the biggest challenges of setting up Crafty Yankee? Well, at the very beginning, and it really evolved from a sale that someone, Kate Beatty, uh, who lives on Castle Road, still does live there. She had a sale at her house uh, every in the uh, weekend before, it would have been this weekend, the weekend before Thanksgiving. And my husband used to laughingly call it the neighborhood exchange where we all made things and then we bought them from each other. But there were some very clever and wonderful things as part of that. Um, and that really led to the Crafty Yankee and it was all consignment at the beginning. And it was, we were on Muzzy Street upstairs and we had some classes and things like that as we were interested in the crafts in general. And then uh, when we had the chance to move to Mass Avenue, then you had to get more serious. My husband says I learned more uh, doing Crafty Yankee than I learned in college. It might be true, but you, you know, when you have to meet a payroll and you have to make some decisions about you know, what to buy and what not to buy and how to, and uh, you learn, you learn uh, that kind of management. In the garden, it's kind of the similar thing, you know, how much of this do I plant? And, you know, these last dry years, these last two dry, sometimes you'll plant something, nothing came up, it just it was too hot or, or whatever. So um, you learn and it's never perfect or easy. I, I look at those people talking about billions of dollars and thinking, you know, that's, that's a different world than uh, the one that most people live in. <laughs> well, it, I think part of what really stands out for people in Crafty Yankee, looking at it as uh, like an anchor that you put there into the center, was there are a lot of women artisans and craftspeople who otherwise don't have a way to share their expertise. Um, as you said, sometimes there can be seasonal things, but in reality, we all go gift shopping throughout the year for birthdays or other occasions. And you could go to the mall and buy something machine made or mass produced, or you could go to the Crafty Yankee and pick out something that's unique and one of a kind and very often made by a woman who for her, that is a way to express her creativity, but also a business. And so thinking about that, I think, I think Kathy said, Shirley Lane was already selling items through the shop. When she, when she took over after you. So did you establish that relationship? Because she is another one of our, uh, our yes. honorees this year. And so it's a nice tie-in. It is, yeah. Oh, and I gave so many of her sweaters as gifts, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think we, I think she came to us originally We um, with her sweaters. And of course, we just love them. They were, I think maybe they were at Kate's I, because they've been around a while. She and um, somebody named uh, Mary O'Connor were great knitters and made many wonderful children's things uh, for that. For that, so yes, uh, and and then establishing a relationship, you know, with them over many years. I often tell the story of the weavers we used uh, at Crafty Yankee, and then they these are a man and woman who made their entire living weaving the two of them you know throws and baby blankets and placemats and uh things like that so um it, it's it's good you know it's it definitely resonates the layers that we see and let's see her as we look at women across time and help make them visible because you're you're reenacting many of the things that women have done over time, but you've taken it to another level of helping other people get connected. So bringing wares to a marketplace here, the market garden, bringing food to the 
people at the food pantry. Um, as you think about these many different chapters, what stood out for us, and again, for the Girl Scouts who are listening is, people often say, what do you wanna be when you grow up? What do you wanna do? And our old way was to pick like one thing. I wanna be this. Um, and yet you've demonstrated that you can be many things, a retail business owner, you can be a volunteer, you can be a community organizer. Um, is that something that you expected when you started out or something that grew organically? Well, my parents, I'm Italian descent and my, my parents always garden. So garden was always an, an interest. Uh, and I'm, I mean, my, I'm a nurse. So that was my first thing. And then I learned ceramic studio ceramics in Australia. And that's what led to the crafty Yankee. So it kind of just kept going. Um, so, uh, and then you're always working around your own family obligations and things like that. I mean, there's times when you can do a lot and there's times when you have to pull back you know, for whatever reasons. So um, uh, that, I, I, we're so lucky to have those opportunities, really, um, because you keep, you keep alive that, you know, you, you, well, bicycling was it, my husband's a big biker and, you know, some of the bikeway and so forth it had in the early days, you know, he commuted by bike uh, before the bike path for many years and uh, we're, has always worked hard on those projects. And we've done many wonderful bicycling things uh, together. So um, uh, there's, there's many opportunities. You just have to go for it. <laughs> um, also, it takes some confidence. You have to do it once and then you get better at it. And then, you know, there's some setbacks, but then don't get discouraged. Keep, keep trying and, and refining things. And then an exciting chapter you're about to maybe try something new you mentioned was weaving, which I wondered if we might close with this next adventure that perhaps you will get to have learning something <laughs> well, really different. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, it's not that different. I've always been a texture person, textile person. So I and I over the years, I bought many wonderful kitchen towels handwoven from this girl in Maine who's now uh, retired. But I would love to recreate some of those things that I've used so lovingly for many years. So I wanted just to thank you so much. If anyone has a question that they would like to ask, this is the right time. Um, and we'll have a very short update from Leslie on some of the research she's been doing. But Carla, it's just incredible. It really demonstrates that one individual person can make a tremendous difference and that the work you do directly, but also the work you do connecting so many other people, it really could be invisible work that nobody would see. Um, but one woman is able to get quite a lot done um, and to have these different chapters, which is exciting for all of us thinking about what I like to do next, you know, yeah. and what might, what might we do that would be a way to meet friends in a really interesting way, which you definitely demonstrated. So again, I just want to let everyone go ahead and give like a little thank you round of applause. We're really grateful um, and look forward to seeing you not only on Mass Ave, but on the banner on Mass Ave in the coming season. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And then um, Helen, if we can invite Leslie and Carla, you can stay with us here. And Leslie's just going to share a little bit. Um, Leslie has been researching Margaret Tulip who is a woman in the in the monument that's coming up. Our update on the monument is that uh, Meredith Bergman is in Massachusetts and she is sculpting as we speak. Um, okay. She's reached the point where there's a wood frame and she's adding clay to the frame and it's going to be very exciting. As soon as we can, we'll try to get some pictures out to community members to follow it. Um, among the people in the monument, of course, Ruth Buckman is included who had a garden and the society has brought that garden back to life which is lovely. Um, and it's diagonally across the street from the Interfaith Garden. So people who haven't seen Ruth Buckman's garden can come take a look. And that also reflects a nice partnership between the Garden Club and the Historical Society. Um, and then Margaret Tulip is one of the women who, as Leslie said, we're trying to understand what might her life have been like and what connections did she have? So Leslie, just thought it'd be great to have people hear a little update on what you're up to. Um, it's funny because I'm so into it. I don't know what I haven't told people. <laughs> but um, one thing that Jesse and I did this summer is we located her granddaughter's grave in Everett, um, which was sort of a chore because the map that the cemetery gives out doesn't fit 
real life, but with the help with this guy named Alan, who had worked there for what, 30 years, 25 years, he helped us find the place where it is. And it was really moving. Um, right now, what I'm working on is I'm trying to find evidence of her mother's arrival, Kate's arrival into Massachusetts, and then Kate being sold um, after it, it was around 1718 when she was sold to the um, to Bowden, who was a merchant and captain himself. And so, what's been interesting about that is there's a lot of slave. I call actually I started just calling them people for sale ads because it's black people, it's Indians, it's you know, white indentured people. I mean, and they, and it just, it's astounding. And one thing I've realized is that, you know, as a state, we did not have that many enslaved people. But if you look at the newspapers, you know, they're published weekly, every week, almost every single week, there are ads for people being sold. And that I think must have desensitized people to some extent. Um, I guess <laughs> I sent this to Jesse. There's a I found a runaway slave ad for one of Benjamin Muzzy's mm -hmm. um, enslaved people, and I can't remember his first name. But his last name is Furnace, and it gave very detailed description. It always does in these ads descriptions of what he's wearing, but he's also wearing a horse lock on his ankle. And you know, one thing that we have this idea about enslavement in Massachusetts is that it was different. It definitely was different from what was going on in the South, but there was still violence and people obviously being bound and against their will. And do I have any more time? Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted, I wanted to say that it's so helpful because we just thought we would close with a little snapshot. The research team meets on Monday nights at 730 and is open for anyone. And I think it's thinking about Carla's place being again next to the town common that we all walk by every day. And maybe you think it's a battle green. Maybe you think it's a town common where we think about where was the meeting house, but also these invisible women, right. they were here, they were doing things. And we don't know exactly what Ruth Buckman's life was like or Margaret Tulips. But in closing, we just want to invite people to, if they're interested, um, pick up one of the women's names and join our research team. You don't even have to come to the meeting. We have some people where there are more than one person researching one woman's life, trying to see what we can find out. And of course, there are scant written records about women. Um, they were not always considered important the way we know women always have been important. Um, and just and just maybe kind of leave it there as a little a little glimpse into the work that's taking place. Carla, we are so grateful again for you to spend time with us. Oh, yes, Carla. I just want to add some a historical note here that it was a group of women that they, when Carlton Staples bought the Hancock Clark House so it wouldn't be destroyed, mm -hmm. he they sent some ladies, about eight of them, from the Historical Society house to house to gain to get contributions. And they got enough to pay him back, buy the lot, and they had money left over to make the museum. Okay, and open it up to the thing. But that was the ladies they sent to do the practical work and they got it done. <laughs> that's that's terrific. I did not know that. And that's yeah. exactly where it's really been very nice in the research meeting is to have different people working on different stories. And we just made a, we decided to make a file called like, I don't treasures, things we found where you find a document and you're like, this could be interesting for other people. Um, so anyone who's interested, the other part of the project is called Put Her on the Map. And we're working with a map of 1775, the day of the battle. It's a map that was made in 1924 by Edwin Worthen. And the map just shows the simple streets in Lexington with the houses and the man's name who lives there. And it seems very simple, but it's quite a bit of work. It's just, well, okay, the man lived there, but he wasn't alone. So who were the women? Who were the children? Were there enslaved people or indentured servants? And just trying to get that fleshed out look at our community, because as we were sort of chatting with Carla in the beginning, people were here. The battle was important. And also people had to eat food and have clothing and live their daily lives. So understanding our community, understanding who was the Carla Fortman in 1769 and 1775, that is part of what Lexi Her will continue over the winter while Meredith is at work. And we wanna thank the library. Thank everyone for coming. Our next event will be January 16th. Our speaker series will continue celebrating our Women's Banner honorees. We're looking forward to speaking with Melanie Lynn, 
who is the current president of the Chinese American Association of Lexington, and also Joyce Miller, who was recognized for her work on the Conservation Commission. It'll be another way for us to think about the land, the value of land, and certainly about sharing land um, with the entire community. Um, so Helen, it's back to you. Um, and Lexi, we're just so grateful to be here together with you. Well, thank you, Jesse, for moderating such a wonderful discussion. And thank you, Carla, for all that you've done. And thank you, Leslie, for joining us today. We will see you in January. Take a look at our calendar. And as soon as we have the information up, please register. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice thank day. You. Bye. 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 Bye.